This is Bloomberg Equality. I'm Caroline Hyde. I'm Romain Bostic. Every Thursday through the month of June, we're broadening our, our coverage of markets and the economy to take an all-inclusive look at what social equity and equality truly mean for companies, for investors, and ultimately for our collective global prosperity. We're going to go deep into several key topics, including fair access to capital and the divisive politics around gender identity. Today, Romain, we're going to be focusing in on artificial intelligence. Computer scientists, John McCarthy coined the term back in the 1950s. Scientists were experimenting with computer vision and giving machines the ability to read. That's all as far back as 1960s. But look, it was November, the arrival of ChatGPT, the chatbot, that was the milestone that sent kind of shockwaves through the global zeitgeist, putting the tech into our hands. AI promises, well, personalized products, services that are cheaper, more efficient, free from human error, but no new technology comes without risks. AI experts have come out with concerns about everything from disinformation, job loss, to amplification of bias, even extinction. Over the next 30 minutes, Rain, we will dive into the debate with experts that actually work within the technology and try to answer the questions of whether, look, the rise in AI is going to yeah. narrow some of our social stratification. Mm -hmm. Maybe it will broaden it. But there are so many doomers out there at the moment. But on the other flip side, it is the promise of productivity. And I mean, I watch your co-host of Bloomberg Technology, and I know you and your co-host have sort of played around with ChatGPT. So you see the promise. You see the potential there. But as you just mentioned, of course, there are some potential pitfalls. One thing that I think is pretty pretty sure, at least is when you talk to folks in the market, is that this is going to stay. Whether it is good or bad, there certainly is some money to be made, and there is a lot of money already chasing this. This is still a relatively nascent industry. When you look at the chart behind me, you get a sense here, not only of where we are right now, this is less than $100 billion in revenue generated by generative AI, but you look what happens over the next six, eight, 10 years. We're going to surpass $1 trillion in revenue coming from generative AI, $1.3 trillion, Caroline, by the time we get to 2032. We've therefore got to discuss what's the ramifications as you make this money, what guardrails need to be in place, what already are some of the pitfalls. Very pleased to welcome for a bit of a roundtable discussion, Angel Bush, the founder of Black Women in AI, and Meredith Broussard, NYU professor and author of a new book, More Than a Glitch, Confronting Race, Gender, and Ability Bias in Technology. And I want to start, therefore, with you, Meredith. Just the, the focus here on the potential for glitches. Already, we're talking about existential issues with AI, but can you remind us, in the here and the now, how are we seeing disinformation bias already being amplified by AI? So one of the things that's really important to keep in mind is that AI is just math. It's really complicated, beautiful math. And so we tend to get excited about talking about these existential risks and the robot takeover and the you know, huge financial potential. But we need to really focus on actual harms being experienced by real people today. And so people are really suffering as a result of bias in AI, especially in financial decisions. Like if an automated mortgage approval system makes a decision against uh, approving somebody for a mortgage, that's a way that somebody is experiencing a harm from AI. What's interesting, your previous book, Artificial Unintelligence, talk, talked about techno chauvinism, a blind belief in the superiority, superiority of tech. But also, it goes around to sort of the auditing of all of this. And, Angel, I want to bring you in here because you are building a community of trying to ensure that the right people are at the table when it comes to assessing the data that things are being built on, or indeed helping build artificial intelligence out at certain companies and communities. How are you? hiring corporate America react to this? Well, when it comes to um, what we're doing in particular, as far as black women in AI and corporate America, we're working with our partners at NVIDIA to teach black women in particular uh, machine learning and data science. We're working with Capital One to better understand the hiring process, interview techniques, and case studies, because we have to start with the basics. And we also are working, most importantly, with the University of Houston uh, Computational Biomedicine Lab, which we have a three-year commitment to award uh, research assistantships. And so when we're talking about working with in AI and we're talking about the corporate response, we've re received an overwhelming response of support in making sure that we provide that access and that opportunity through the initiatives that we've created. Angel, can you give us a little sense here about the particular sectors, the industries there that have already started to embrace this, the ones that you anticipate that over the next few years will be the broadest adopters of this technology? 
I think the biggest adopters real, really will be um, and the biggest impact we will see in employment and education. And what's really important in that is we have to start working at the state level in particular to ensure that the curriculum includes artificial intelligence and not included or seen as an elective. Because when artificial intelligence is seen as an elective, then only certain school districts will be able to afford that yeah. access. So when we're talking about impact, we we'll definitely see it in the education sector. Uh, Meredith, I want to bring you back into this conversation here, and I don't want to make this too personal, but we talk about the industries that will utilize this. And we should point out there are several industries that have been utilizing it, particularly in the healthcare space. And I went through some healthcare challenges last year, and I was interested in seeing how they went about the diagnosis over a month's, months long period here, and how much of that of course, involved the doctor, involved the humans, but also did involve, I guess, what can be considered AI to a certain extent? Mm -hmm. Well, I went through my own health challenges uh, a few years ago. I, I was diagnosed with breast cancer, and one of the things that I saw as I was going through my electronic me medical record was I saw a note that said, this scan was read by an AI. Mm -hmm. And I thought, wow, what did the AI find? Who built the AI? What kind of bias is in this AI? And then, of course, because I had cancer, I forgot about it. But uh, then I came back to it later. And what I did was an experiment. Yeah. I took an open source uh, AI cancer detection algorithm. Right. Uh, and I ran my own scans through it to see if it would detect my breast cancer. And I did that as a way of writing about the state of the art in AI-based cancer detection. Well, I am curious if I could just follow on that real quickly here, because one of the reports that I got, and I went through a, a cancer treatment myself, and one of the reports I got back was kind of alarming. And it's similar, no, there was a notation there that let it be known that, this, that the results were sort of generated by that. So of course I go, I call the doctor, and they kind of told me to calm down. They said, oh, this isn't that bad, but I raised the question as to why send me something like that that I clearly don't understand, mm -hmm. that at least on the surface looks very, it looked alarming. Mm -hmm. um, why not use the human being in that situation to communicate what was a very sensitive result? Oh, I would much rather get test results from my doctor mm -hmm. and be able to uh, to talk with them immediately. Mm -hmm. That thing where the test results get delivered in your portal and you see them before you talk to the doctor, like that gives me a lot of anxiety. I know there are people out there who really like to get their test results first. Mm -hmm. I am not one of them. So really better design would be for people to have that option, mm -hmm. right? But one of the ways, one of the problematic ways that people design AI is uh, the developers decide, okay, this is the way it's gonna be and then they just roll that out to everybody. Mm -hmm. Well, there's a lot of variation among people, and so it's a lot better to give people options. Meredith, just sticking with you for a second, algorithmic auditing is something you're relatively optimistic about. It exists. So when we're talking about how already AI is being applied, and we thank you both for sharing your stories there, when you're thinking about the ethical way in which of applying it, you think basically we need to run more We'll test on the data, ensure that we're putting not garbage in ultimately. Hmm. We, we are putting a lot of garbage in. I mean, ChatGPT, for example, is trained on data scraped from the internet. The internet is so wonderful and it's so toxic, mm. right? Uh, so the Washington Post has done this really interesting investigation where you can actually look at these sites that are used to train ChatGPT and BARD and a lot of the other uh, generative AI systems, right? But algorithmic auditing shows a lot of promise. And that is a process that algorithmic accountability reporters like me use in order to open up black boxes, yeah. investigate algorithms, look at the inputs, look at the outputs, and actually measure how much bias is in this system. Mm. Right? We're not doing enough of that now, uh, and we really need to do more. It's a growth industry. Ultimately, the underlying problem, Angel, is society, actually. The bias is baked into society and therefore gets amplified in the data that it's used on. You are trying to fix that very bias when it comes to the people, the, the race, the gender, the people who are currently working within AI. Are you finding that they can tackle the bias within the data as well? And do you think the fact that more people of color at the table building the algorithms will help with monitoring the bias within the data? Well, let's, let's talk about the table. When we talk about having more... Um, 
minorities or marginalized communities at the table, we also have to um, embed power, authority, and influence uh, because uh, it is not enough to be at the table if we don't have uh, power, authority, or influence to raise those questions of ethics, to raise those questions of we see something wrong and we need to stop right here. A great person said to me, Angel, when we start building these systems, we need to first ask, what problem are we solving? And I will go a step further and say, are we creating bigger problems than we're solving? And so when we're talking about having people at the table and we're talking about looking at this data, I agree with Meredith, we really have to start doing an audit and trying to figure out first, where's this data coming from? Who's saying this data is correct and who's saying it It has already gone through a process of cleansing? And so when we talk about these things of having diversity and bringing people to the table, let's never forget our authority and influence. Angel Bush, well said, founder of Black Women in AI. Meredith Broussard of NYU. We've talked about the concerns surrounding AI and the labor market. We thank you both for that. And, and actually, I just want to dig in a little bit more deeply into how some of the impact of AI, particularly in the workforce, are having a biased outcome too. Just take a listen. Women, we are going to be hit harder by AI. Here's why. We've heard the worry that artificial intelligence can amplify bias due to the data it's trained on. But it might also amplify bias in the workforce. One HR firm, Revelio Labs, identified the jobs most likely to be replaced by AI and then the gender breakdown of those jobs. Guess what? They're generally held by women. Bill in account collectors, payroll clerks, executive assistants. Already, we've seen it hit home. Just think, IBM has said it's slowing hiring in back office functions where AI can replace roles like HR. Well, guess what gender dominates there? IBM alone said that this could hit close to 8,000 jobs. Reskilling, retraining, that is gonna be key here. Revelio Labs highlighting basically again the issue yeah. that this is a society problem and AI yeah. amplifies it in some ways. It amplifies it and you have to wonder are these questions being asked by the decision makers? I know they're being asked by you and they're being asked by other folks out there but the people who are really driving this, are A, are they aware of that? Mm. And B, are they really asking questions of, as to how to rectify it and address it? And they certainly, when they make statements saying, IBM saying 7,800 jobs likely to mm. be removed by AI, they must be realizing who owns those back office jobs, who is in HR, who ultimately, what yeah. does that mean for the makeup of their own employee base? Well, that raises a big question here about regulation and the government's mm. role in all this. In fact, coming up after the break on our Bloomberg Equality segment, we're going to take a closer look at that. The docket of governments across the globe, the US, the EU, the UK and China, all looking to set up guardrails on the technology. We'll discuss after the break. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Equality, a focus today on artificial intelligence, and let's just say it's complicated. A complex field in the artificial intelligence now drawing the interest of would-be government regulators with the European Union leading the way. That block actually set to vote on a law this month, Caroline, called the AI Act. And actually, the focus of the AI Act keeps on getting bigger. And it's really caught the attention of many of the builders in the space in particular. Look, it is actually set to vote on the proposal as soon as June the 17th. So once again, EU ahead of the curve when it actually comes to bringing real regulation to bear on new technologies. It's aiming to add safeguards not only on the deployment of artificial intelligence, but also the development. And that's actually something that's built momentum as they've been discussing the overall oversight of this regulation. Look, once again, this comes down to penalizing profits. This is about fines and up to 7% in terms of annual revenue can be affected. But actually, this goes broader. EU sets the tone for the rest of the world here. And actually, Bloomberg spoke with the European Commission Executive Vice President, Margaret Vestia, about the proposal and what she sees as an important global push for regulation. Take a listen. This is bigger than Europe. U.S. is important, but it is bigger than the U.S. But if the two of us take the lead with close friends, I think we can push something that will make us all much more comfortable with the fact that generative AI is now in the world and is developing at amazing speeds. As we focus on regulation, let's get right to our next guest, Meg Mitchell. She founded and co-led Google's ethical AI group and really a pioneer in the field of machine learning. She's now chief ethics scientist 
at the AI startup Hugging Face. It's a leading voice for open source AI development. And I do want to start there, Meg, on the open source part of this here, because I was always under the impression that a big part of what we've seen when it comes to AI and generative AI, to be specific, already was being open source. Is that not the case? Um, a lot of a lot of stuff was being put online, uh, but not everything. There are sort of trade secrets that generally haven't been made available, and the data hasn't been made available in a lot of cases. Let's talk about, therefore, when there are a lot of small companies busily scraping, putting, building large language models. There's big companies, whether it be Google, whether it be OpenAI teaming up with Microsoft, but ultimately they all have to be perhaps put guardrails in place. The regulation that you see coming from the EU, does it have the right sort of backbone in place to be able to not stifle innovation, but also to ensure that we're building AI responsibly here? Yeah, I'm a bit worried about that, actually. Um, so recently, the EU AI Act work had to quickly add details on what they called foundation models. Um, and the need to just sort of scramble to put in additional legislation after something has been worked on for years is probably not a good sign. Um, their approach is largely risk-based, mm -hmm. which I think does have merit. I think that that is one way to go. Um, you can also think about it in terms of being rights-based, however. So rights-based for individuals. What are you allowed and not allowed to have with respect to AI? And I feel like that might be a little bit more amenable to changes in technology as it further evolves. Given how fast we've come in this process and given what you alluded to, earlier about this idea of some of this information being proprietary, some of this information kind of in a black box for the companies that are developing it. How do you create a situation where regulators have not only the access but the understanding of what's being created? Right. So this is where different kinds of audits come in. So you can think of first party, second party, and third party audits, where a first party audit is sort of the self-regulation approach. The third party audit is where external auditors can come in. Um, and second party audit is the kind of situation where it would be someone under a non-disclosure agreement. So similar to how finances can be audited uh, by the IRS in the US, you can imagine a situation where governmental officials have some sort of clearance to to look at the, propriety da the proprietary data in order to make sure that it's addressing all the things that need to be addressed. Meg, the EU seems to be leading the charge on actually voting on certain proposals. Here in the US, we've seen some key leaders within AI from IBM, but notably Sam Altman of OpenAI, getting in front of lawmakers, talking about the risks. You've been critical of the fact that many people are going more for the impending doom of humanity rather than the real risks to bias, to disinformation in the here and the now. When yeah. you've heard what OpenAI and other companies said about so-called self-regulation or at least dictating the path of regulation, has it been the right one? Right. It's really interesting because it seems to be sort of like a bait and switch where they're saying, let's have regulation, but actually about this other stuff that isn't at all what we're doing now. Uh, so it's a way of sort of playing nice with regulators while also not being regulated for things that legitimately should be regulated right now and uh, distracting away from low hanging fruits. So low hanging fruits like disclose that something is AI generated, right? Uh, so this approach they've taken is a little bit funny it's a little bit of a distraction for what we can do right now. Uh, and so it's, it's a bit frustrating to see that, yeah. I, I don't mean to be uh, too much of a pessimist here, but I, I, when I think about the potential regulation over something like AI, I also think about kind of the unfinished business when it comes to regulation of just the Internet and technology as we know it today. Right. Of course, technologies that arose decades ago and we still have not had any real consensus, at least at the regulatory level, of the best way to handle it. Uh, yeah, I mean, this is part of, at least in the U.S., part of the argument for innovation is that you don't want to add too many constraints. And I think, um, at least in the U.S., they did take intentionally um, a more laid-back approach, didn't want to infringe on the innovation too, too much. I think there's a little bit of a sea change now, whereas before there wasn't large cooperation from large companies to have something like regulation. And now there is, to some extent, um, in part, well, there's a lot of, I can go into why, uh, but I think there is a sea change now. I do have some hope that meaningful regulation can be enacted within the next five years, mm -hmm. uh, that's fundamentally different than what's been able to pass before. 
All right, Meg, we're going to have to leave it there. Really appreciate you taking time uh, to explain something that a lot of us are still trying to wrap our heads around. Meg Mitchell there over at Hugging Face, a leading voice here for open source AI development. Coming up here on Bloomberg Equality, our takeaways from today's conversations, plus a little bit of a glimpse ahead as to our programming for the rest of the month. This is Bloomberg. GPT-4 will, uh, I think, entirely automate away some jobs, and it will create new ones that we believe will be much better. I think the most important thing that we could be doing and can and should be doing now is to prepare the workforce of today and the workforce of tomorrow for partnering with AI technology. This is a technology that is developing, right? It's develop developing. We know that if we just leave it to everyone who we generally leave it to, there'll be a huge amount of have-nots and a small amount of haves. This is a place that we should have a community working towards, working together, technical community, government communities, um, education, not for NGOs, on this unbelievable gift, mm. right, that we have and trying to figure out a way to make it um, better, good for all. When new technology brings big changes, sometimes just be responsible, you know, think about both the pluses and the minuses, because I really fear, I believe more than anything else, the apex of everything that's good in the world is truth. Some of the big leaders in business weighing in here on the promise of AI, and I think a lot of times we talk about it almost as binary. It's either going to create the greatest world in, uh, that we've ever known or it's going to destroy us all. But there's a lot of nuance here. As always, mm -hmm. there is devil in each yeah. detail. You cannot just be a complete doomsayer and thinking about the end of humanity without thinking about the here, the now, the bias, the, the health ramifications, the jobs ramifications, mm -hmm. and something that ultimately do we have to turn to governments and to regulation? Because, look, self-regulation over social media didn't work. It's a good conversation to have, though, because anytime you have new developments, even if they're not as massive as what we're seeing with AI, there's always that question of, does this make us better as a society, or does it sort of drive a wedge between us and make things worse? And I think we're kind of at an inflection point to talk about that now. Yeah, Ursula Burns, there's, don't want just to have a small amount of haves and a lot of have-nots. All right, we're going to continue our special coverage every Thursday through the month of June of Bloomberg Equality. And next up, we're going to talk the workplace a little bit more on the issues facing leaders in the corporate world, more diversity, so much more of that to come. We really hope that you continue to join us here for these special episodes. On behalf of Caroline and myself, this is Bloomberg.